Okay, so we're going to kick this off. I'm just going to say uh, I'm really honored to be introducing uh, these guys. They're amazing. Um, Andrew and Daniel and Zach and Adam do amazing work. Uh, I've known them for a long time and I've drunk on many continents with them. Uh, so just this is an honor to have them here. And yeah, when they say it's broken, it's busted. So without further ado, hit it off. It's gonna make me crawl. Thank you. <laughs> it's so nice to give a talk with a bottle of whiskey here. It's great, I think it's great. So, uh, I'm Andrea Barizani, and then we have... Then I'm Daniela Bianco. Yourself. I'm Zach Franken. And I'm Adam Laurie. Too many speakers. It looks like a panel. Anyway, so we're going to talk about uh, chip and pin, and we're going to talk about why we think it's definitely broken uh, also. Um, yeah, if you're all very good and behave yourselves, um, major malfunction will be making a guest appearance at the end and giving you a happy ending. Okay, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> And also, how many of you have seen uh, mine and Daniela's previous talks here at DEF CON? How many of you? Raise your hand. Okay, so we also will show in the middle of our talk how you can get laid using our technique. We think it's very important to prove that you can use these hacking techniques to get girls, you know? There's no point in doing something very, very technical and then, you know, what's the point? Yeah, it's just bias. No, no, no. You get laid. And we've got to prove that with a very cheesy Italian-style movie because we're Italian. So, you know, that's how we ruin our reputation every two years or so. And they, Zach and Adam, they didn't want to take part in it. I, I don't know why. I mean, uh, we were asked. We declined. Politely, of course. You'll see why. Right. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, when we say chip and pin, uh, we basically mean uh, uh, a standard which is called EMV. Uh, EMV stands for European MasterCard and Visa, and it's a global standard uh, for uh, defining how smart cards can be used for uh, credit and debit card operations. Um, and it's called, in different countries, it's named in different ways. They all, every single country have their own marketing terms. Chip and pin is, I think that's the term for UK, uh, but it's also uh, a very good name uh, worldwide. Um, and so why are they going to use the chip on credit cards? Uh, first of all, they want to move away from Max Stripe because as we know from, uh, the excellent work did, uh, done by Adam. Max stripes are uh, crap, and they can be very, very easily cloned. Um, it is a technology that allows to do offline card verification and transaction approval. So your point of sale doesn't need to connect to a backend in order to approve the transaction. And for some reason, that was uh, it's considered to be something a good feature. Uh, and you can also have multiple applications on one card. So you can have debit and credit on the same card because the chip can support several applications. Um, one of the problems with chip and PIN uh, is as it's, because it's considered to be a secure technology because, uh, well, you're using smart cards, so it must be secure. Uh, they, there's a liability shift that goes away from the merchant uh, to the bank, but also it can shift to the card holder itself. Because what they say if, is that if you do a chip and pin transaction and you use the pin, because now you have to use the pin in order to use a credit card, then we prove undeniably that the final customer has been using the card or that the final customer has been negligent into storing the pin because maybe you've written down somewhere and someone found it. Uh, and so pin verification becomes, increasingly becomes a proof of cardholder presence and it's very hard in case of fraud to prove that it wasn't you. And we think this is a problem, uh, and we're going to uh, show you exactly why. Uh, also, if you look at, at some fine print of uh, the zero liability policies, uh, we also see that some do not apply in case of ATM transactions because you always have to use the PIN on ATM transactions. So it's a, it's a sketchy area. Some countries are doing better uh, regarding this, but some others, are, they're, they're not. Uh, this is one example. This is an article from, from uh, June. Uh, there was a fraud uh, for $80,000. Someone bought a race car with a credit card. <laughs> which I think it's quite impressive. And, and the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce said, our records show that this was a chip and pin transaction, and this means that a customer personal card and a personal pin number were used. As a result, the customer is liable for the transaction. And there's a uh, lawsuit going on there. So 
EMV, uh, so you don't have it here yet, uh, except for a few banks, which are, um, they give you an option to get a credit card with a chip. It is widely adopted over Europe. Uh, every, uh, nearly every credit card is being issued right now in Europe has a chip. Um, and they're pushing this for banning uh, Magstripe fallback. However, they're not really doing a good job about that because as of today, uh, Magstripe fallback is accepted pretty much everywhere. Um, and also if you have a credit card with the chip, uh, the Magstripe tells the terminal that there's a chip. So if you, swipe, if you try to swipe it, then the terminal says, no, use the chip. But then what you can do, if you put the card inside the chip slot and the chip is not readable because you put a piece of tape on it, then the terminal says, well, okay, then use the max drive because I cannot read the chip. So, so they're not really doing a good job about this entire fallback thing. And, and of course, as long as one country has max drive, then it's a problem. So that's why the US will move to, to chip and pin because there's a huge pressure, pressure from Europe to, to move uh, uh, and use the chip and also, uh, Pretty soon, when you travel abroad, you won't be able to use your credit card if you don't have a chip. So just for that reason, you will get it. Also, when we travel to the US, the US is flagged as a dodgy country for ATM transactions as far as Europe's concerned. So it's like going to Eastern Europe. All of a sudden, we've got to tell the bank we're going to the States or else we can't get any money out. They sprung that on me a few years back. It's like, great, 24 hours. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> so. Um, there's been already a few research about EMV. Uh, one was made by uh, a very nice group of researchers, Cambridge, where they show you that you can use a stolen card without a PIN, which defeats the entire purpose of chip and PIN. Uh, and that was an implementation flaw, and I'm gonna go in detail about that later on. Um, and, but of course, the industry claims that all these attacks are very, very difficult, and, and so on, and they have procedures, and, and so on. So. Uh, we analyzed uh, the feasibility of, of scheming and cloning uh, uh, and intercepted the PIN when it comes to um, chip and PIN. So, that. so uh, hopefully everyone here is uh, familiar with uh, existing card skimmers. Uh, so generally they are attached to, to devices like ATMs. Uh, and we'll have a quick look at those in a minute. Uh, we are going to specifically ignore these devices uh, because they exist already. And, and what we are going to have a look at uh, later on in this presentation is can we turn a standard pause terminal that you would use in a shop into a skimming device? So here you see ATM skimmers. Um, you know, sometimes the pin is captured by uh, a camera hidden above. Sometimes it's captured by a, a kind of replacement keypad overlay. And in some cases, we've seen an, the entire bottom sill of the ATM, including the keypad. I mean, this thing is literally this long. Some guys just rock up, clonk. So I always give ATMs a bit of a once-over before I use them. It's like, oh, does this look as, as if it's just been glued down? No, no, we're OK. Uh, so. So yeah, so we're, so we're going to kind of move on from ATM skinners and see if we can actually uh, try and skim the EMV protocol coming out the, the chip itself. And because, you know, like all these things, the, the, because it's got to mate electrically with the pause terminal, the terminals are exposed. They have to be or else, you know, no connection happens. So. We're going to have a look at that. Also, it's really hard, just like it is with a lot of ATM skimmers, to actually verify that, you know, if, if they're done well, to actually verify that the terminal you're putting your card into hasn't been tampered or is, in fact, a, a real terminal. So uh, Andrea knows about uh, a little story of someone that tried to submit an entire ATM front to a 3D printing house. Right. 
And, they, uh, and this company uh, detected that and said, okay, maybe we're not going to approve that. And they blogged about it. Uh, and I think it's uh, discriminating, right? I mean, what if it was some security researcher or someone that works at a bank? I mean, it's really unfair. But anyway, there's really <laughs> a huge activity going on into trying to build these, these schemers. But, uh, but also, with an EMV scanner, one of the nice things is that the, the pause terminal provides power because it has to power the card up. So it can power the skimmer up as well, which is quite handy, no batteries. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take you through uh, some details of uh, a device later on in the presentation. OK. So yeah, we think this is a scary prospect. And now comes the time when we show you where you can get the girls using this technology. Do you want to see that? Right on. I do actually play the blonde in this one. Okay, that's it. And he does a really good oh, job. Hi. I want to buy you a very expensive rice. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hello. Hello there. <coughs> so, my woman needs some glasses. Sure. Oh, my God. These are the latest. Oh, beautiful. What do you think, darling? Oh, I really like them. I like them. So? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we wear mine. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, can I play with plastic? It works. OK. Oh, I forgot the summary. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah, no, sorry. I forgot these slides where I mentioned that the GER is the actual return of investment. And it's a very strong business point on our part. So. OK, so um, what's interesting about uh, talking to smart cards uh, is the way uh, the data is actually transmitted between the card and the reader. Um, it's done using things called APDUs, uh, and these APDUs are in plain text, although they may contain cryptograms. Um, in the case of the PIN, uh, as you can see here, the, the, the second APDU in the example is actually doing a PIN verification, and we see the PIN 6666 in plain text in that example. Um, now, a PIN on a um, credit card, on a chip and PIN card, is not like um, a PIN on, on your mobile phone. So on your mobile phone, to, you have to actually put the PIN in, if it's PIN locked, to unlock the SIM before you can actually use it. 
on a credit card, the PIN is entirely optional. You can read all the data from the card and never actually ask the card to verify the PIN. You still get all the data that's stored on the card. Um, so uh, basically what happens is when you stick the card into the machine, the machine reads all the data it can from the card, decides from that data what it's going to do next, including how it's going to authenticate the card, whether it should verify the PIN, whether it should take a signature, whether it should do nothing at all. Um, and then the transaction proceeds from there. So basically, there's a list within the terminal that says what kind of authentication methods are available. And there's a list within the card which says what, what type are available or acceptable. And they walk down the list together until they find a matching pair. And then they try that. Um, and here we have an example of the data that's stored in, in um, some of the, the data files. So this particular um, file has stuff like track two, which is an actual copy of your mag stripe um, with some small changes. So I can take your chip and pin card and read off a copy of the mag stripe without ever verifying the pin. So I've effectively skimmed your mag stripe in a chip and pin card. So that's the, the skimming part of it. We've taken that. We also need to get the, the pin itself. Um, within that data, you, as you can see, you've got the, the effective date, the expiry date, um, the PAN, which is the primary account number, so the actual card number, and so on, card name, and so on. You can actually reconstruct um, the mag stripe from that data, but as I say, you've also got an image of the data anyway, so generally you wouldn't, wouldn't need to do that. Um, do you want to just talk quickly about the CVV? Yes, so it used to be uh, uh, since I think two or three years ago that 100% uh, of the data present on Max, right, was present on the actual chip. So again, as Adam said, uh, if you skim the chip, which is considerably easier from a hardware perspective to do uh, on a point of sale device, you can then clone to Mac Stripe right away, and then you can use the Mac Stripe either in a country where the chip is not accepted or by doing the trick, uh, which I explained before, that you swipe, then you put a chip which cannot uh, be read, and then you swipe again. Uh, they realized after a few years that that was a problem, uh, and now uh, the data uh, present on the chip which allows you to clone to Mac Stripe is all there except for a free digit number, which is called the CVV, which now is different on the smart card. So, so it is some form of protection, but knowing that uh, all of this is based on a free digits number is quite worrying because, uh, first of all, if you clone to a thousand different cards, one will be right if you try all the CVV from uh, 000 to 999, which, you know, it might not be a huge deal. Uh, and also, if you can massively uh, skim uh, credit cards with the chip, and, and you can massively do it with, with, uh, when you do it at a point of sale, uh, even if you try random CVV, you will get some right. And, 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 and also, in most cases, um, banks are really not doing a very good job in, in, in warning you uh, that there's a fraud if they see a CVV which is incorrect. We just assume that for some reason the max stripe doesn't be read correctly, and they'll move on. Um, so it is some sort of protection. It is good to know that we cannot clone to Max right the way, but you know, being slave of a free digits number nowadays is not that comforting. Um, so, um, so here we talk about uh, what you can do by using the data which you get from the chip for online usage. So, as it turns out. Um, there are many uh, websites that they do not check the security code nowadays. Uh, and, and ironically, I was frauded. My credit card was frauded while we were making this talk, which I think is very nice. And, and it, my credit card was used on uh, five different websites on the internet that they do not check the security code. And also, it was used against one uh, kind of company which acts as a broker that gives you cash uh, uh, if you try to make a transaction without a security code. There are very dodgy companies that they exist uh, specifically for enabling uh, this kind of behavior. And all the data that was used for doing the fraud is present on the chip. And, and, and so this is the website, one of the websites that was used, the Dolce Gabbana online store, uh, and they use the data. With, this is an optional security code. 
uh, they got the goods, they, the, the shipment was delivered to them. Uh, so I was warned just five days after, and they also sent a gift to me, paid with my own money from Dolce & Gabbana, <laughs> which I thought was very nice. It was very thoughtful. Here, we're getting your money, but here's a nice Dolce & Gabbana, um, I don't know, full, full art, art, which was <laughs> disgusting. Anyway. Um, and actually, in, in the same period, um, my son went on vacation to uh, Italy, as it happens, and uh, used his chip and pin card in a bar. And a few hours later, he got a call from his bank saying there's someone in Bangkok trying to extract money from a cash machine. So, um, yeah, 50% of us here got frauded on our chip and pin cards in the period where we were preparing these slides. So, pretty good record, really. So, uh, just a quick introduction uh, um, about the different technologies, different families, different kind of uh, chip and pin cards. So basically, um, we have two main families of chip and pin cards, the SDA and the DDA. Uh, SDA stands for static data authentication, while DDA stands for dynamic data authentication. And basically here we are talking about two different uh, kind of, uh, two different technologies uh, used in order to validate the uh, authenticity uh, of the card against the, the terminal. Um, uh, Visa and MasterCard um, mandate that all the cards issued after the uh, 2011 should use uh, DDA. Um, actually, this is not. Uh, yeah, we don't. Is, we don't think it's happening 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, what we what we saw during our our research is uh, that uh, I mean we tested um, about 40. Cards. Yeah, probably yeah. something like that, and only one card was DDA, actually. Go and I got Bank a, of Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I got a new card this year, which will expire in 2015, and it's still uh, SDA. And now it will be clear about the difference between uh, uh, the yeah. two technologies. So, so yeah, SDA cards, uh, um, basically, um, they, uh, they, don't, they are not able to uh, perform a proper encryption. And uh, uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, uh, the data on the card is signed with a, sta a static signature, and the symmetric key is used during the, the actual online transaction. But during the uh, process of the cardholder verification, you will see a little bit more about that uh, in the next slides. Uh, they cannot uh, um, perform the PIN verification in an, an enciphered mode. That means that the PIN verification is always made in clear text when uh, an SDA card is used. Uh, while uh, the DDA cards, uh, the hardware, the actual chip is different and uh, uh, they have a, um, an encryption coprocessor. Um, that's why uh, the, 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 the chip on, on this card is more expensive and um, they can perform a proper encryption and in this case the, 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 the pin uh, can be verified uh, by, the, by the terminal in an enciphered mode. Um, so uh, SDA cards uh, at the end cannot be, uh, cannot be cloned, um, but uh, in, in, a, in a general way, uh, but can still be cloned uh, in order to create uh, the so a so-called uh, yes card. Um, that's a card that's always reply yes when you try to, to verify the PIN, no matter what you are, uh, what you are inserting. And, um, but they can, they can only be used for uh, offline transaction. Maybe we yeah, will see a little bit more. Yeah, and offline transactions, they're very rare in Europe, yeah. in Europe anyway. Yeah. Uh, offline transaction, it means that so when we, do, we have two different steps. One is the validation of the card, which always happens yeah. offline. And then there's a validation of the card holder, which might happen offline or online, and that's the actual transaction. The transaction might happen offline or online, but in Europe, it's most 90% of the time is always online. And that's why uh, an SDA card clone uh, cannot really be used yeah, exactly. uh, in Europe. Um, yeah. How, however, the fact that EMV was pushed also because of enabling offline transactions and the fact that you can actually clone the car for doing offline transaction 
kind of means that the technology doesn't really work. So they realized this, and then they said, well, but with DDA cards, we have a dynamic, a dynamic verification, so you cannot actually clone the card anymore for offline verification because you, you need the real card because there's a challenge response going on. However, what you can do as the validation step of the card and the actual transaction are separate, you can present one valid DDA card for the actual uh, authentication of the card, and then you present a different DDA card for the actual transaction, or actually a fake DDA card, which will reply with something with a non-valid cryptogram, but as the transaction is offline, the terminal has no chance to, to verify that. So even DDA cards, uh, with a more complicated fashion, they can also be cloned. Um, so uh, we discuss uh, EMV scheming usage for Mac Stripe cloning, online usage. Uh, we know that if you steal a car, you can use it without the PIN, thanks for the Cambridge research, which is uh, actually an implementation flaw which can be fixed by, by the banks, but most of them are not doing it because it's very hard to get the implementation of, of this standard right. So the standard here is how long? Five, five books? Four, four books. It's four, four books, books yeah. and every book is about like 300, 400 pages. So no standard needs to be that long. And when you have something which is you know, so complex, everyone will get it wrong while implementing it. So, and, and, and the Cambridge attack is one prime example. Um, so the question we pose, if you use state-of-the-art EMV, we exploit every protection that EMV can enable us, uh, are the pin really protected? Because remember, the pin can prove the cardholder presence, and therefore the use of a stolen card. So let's assume that the Cambridge uh, attack will be fixed, because it can be fixed. Is there still anything that can be done, or is chip and pin, you know, 100% secure? So this is a cardholder verification list, which is read by the terminal in order to uh, determine which cardholder verification methods are going to be used. Uh, as we can see, there is plain text pin verification uh, performed by the card, which is the one that SDA does. There's enciphered pin verified online. Uh, there is a signature. There's an enciphered pin verified by the card, which is what DDA does. Uh, and there's also no CVM required, which is uh, the one that is used actually um, for example, at toll roads, when you want to pay with your credit card, you don't have time to sign something or to enter your PIN, that's when no CVM required is used. And this, this is uh, sent to the terminal, is read by the terminal as a list. So there's a priority of methods. And if the first one fails, then you can fall back to the second one and so on and so on. So this list, it, it, it didn't used to be signed. So remember, SDA and DDAs, they also have a static signature of the data. It didn't used to be signed. But now it is signed on every car. So it is believed to be tamper-proof. If you tamper with the list by doing a man-in-the-middle attack, then the signature of the car will be invalid. So if the authentication method is signature or enciphered pin verified online or enciphered pin verified by the car, then the pin is not sent by the terminal to the car in clear text. And then you cannot uh, skim it, basically. Uh, and it is believed that only when plain text pin verification performed by car is present and selected by the terminal from the CVM list, then the pin can be harvested by the EMV schema. So let's talk a little about action codes. Uh, action codes, so, so assuming that we have a DDA card, okay, that, that can check the pin uh, and cipher it. And as, uh, let's assume that this DDA card has a CVM list with only one entry which says enciphered pin verified by the card. So there's no chance that you can actually have a plain text pin verification. So what can we do? So there are some uh, other uh, pieces of data on the card which are called the issuer action codes, uh, which are uh, impaired with the terminal action codes, which are uh, some settings uh, which are present on the terminal. They specify the policy for accepting or rejecting transactions. So, and the two codes are all together. So there are three kinds, denial, online, default, and the online action codes, they specify which failure condition triggers online transactions. So what does it mean? This is one example. These action codes means do not deny a transaction without attempting to go online if offline SDA fails, transmit <coughs> the transaction online. So basically, the card can say to the terminal, if you fail to verify me for some reason, do not reject me. Let's still work together. 
which, which is you know, kind of a wrong concept. Um, so I never tested terminal and cars pair that we were able to test. We could always manipulate the action code so that the tampering with the CVM list does not result in offline rejection. Uh, and what happens is that when you tamper with the CVM list, even if the signature is invalid, the CVM list is honored by the terminal. So you can always downgrade from uh, enciphered pin verification to plain text pin verification, no matter what kind of card you're using and no matter what the original CVM list was, bypassing completely these two settings which EMV provides you specifically for protecting the card holder verification method. And that's one example of a pin uh, being, being actually skimmed on, on an SDA and DDA cards. So it is broken. And Adam, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so here's an example of a specific transaction that we sniffed. So the slide before, you had um, a protocol analyzer showing you some data going on. We used that to sniff this conversation. Um, so you see in this card, it's inserted in the terminal. It selects the visa application. It reads a bunch of data, makes its decision it's going to go online. And the final command, generate AC, is generate application cryptogram, which is an encrypted packet that's sent to the, the online system to, to verify the PIN or whatever it is that it's doing. If we then take the same transaction in the same machine but now using our man in the middle attack, we've downgraded um, the action code to say don't fail if, um, if you've failed the offline authentication. Um, and we've also downgraded the CVM to say well do a plain text PIN instead of an encrypted one. And so now at the bottom, you see a couple of extra commands have appeared. It, it asks um, how many tries it's got left on the pin, and then it does a pin verification in plain text, and we can see the pin in this case was 1234. It then carries on and does the online transaction. Now, we don't care whether or not that transaction fails because we've achieved our objective. We have now, at the same time as reading all that data, we've logged it all into the skimmer. I can come along with my card my special card, plug it into the machine and it will dump that log onto here. I now have all your card data and your PIN because you did a plain text PIN. So. so, right, so very quickly because we're running out of time. So what can do the backend to detect this kind of behavior? So the backend, of course, will detect that the, uh, authentic the offline authentication fail. Uh, but we don't think that's a, that's a good reason for actually uh, blocking the transaction or invalidating the car because that can happen for several reasons. Uh, and also, uh, the backend will see that the last CVM that was used one, was the plain text pin verification. However, there are ways uh, the, to get around that. Um, this is another piece of, 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 of data which is sent by the card to the backend, which also says if the offline verification was performed or not. Um, and this is actually the bit that can be used to prevent the Cambridge attack because what happens is you, 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 uh, in the Cambridge attack what they do, they, they tell to the terminal that the, that the pin verification has been performed while the card doesn't see any pin verification. And so by correlating this data here with this data here, you can actually tell that the terminal has seen a pin verification and the car has not. So you can block that attack. But no one does it because the, the, every backend is not implemented very well. Anyway, so the, the way that you can prevent this kind of detection, which, again, we don't think uh, it can be used to actually prevent this kind of attack, and, and we get the pin anyway, because all of this backend detection happens after the transaction, and we get the pin already. So one thing that we can do, uh, we can have a downgrade CVM list which says offline pin and then online pin, and when we verify the offline pin, we then send to the card the incorrect pin, so that then we fall back to the second uh, CVM method, and that works, and that's what's going to be in store as the last CVM being performed that the backend can see. And the only downside is that the customer will be prompted twice for the pin, which, well, we don't think it's a huge deal. Um, uh, there are also other ways uh, that I don't have time, so maybe in the QA we can explain. There are other, other ideas which we haven't tested that can, be, can exploit the fact that all the phases are separate to, 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 to have a completely clean uh, terminal verification results and all the other data that the backend sees. So the industry loves to point fingers at impracticality. They say, well, but if you want to skim the cards and do something like this, then you need to build something like this, basically. <laughs> and, and, and that is too big to fit in the POS. <laughs> so 
This is what we've done. So uh, this is called Fly, uh, and uh, you'll find out why it's called Fly in a minute, because we have another device called Spider. But this is, was basically built in a day. We worked together on a project to test some pause terminals, and, and this is one of the devices we came up with. So you see uh, a flexi circuit here, and actually if I can swap across, if you can hit input one. one. Sure. Let's see if we can yeah. see this. Okay. So this is, uh, this is fly. It's uh, really thin. And this was all hand, uh, the board was handmade and hand soldered, so that's why it's got these big vias on it and this particularly large chip on it. Uh, it can be made a lot smaller. And basically, this guy, the green cable here is just for programming the microcontroller, and this uh, little sticky out bit actually has a, an LED on the end, just so we could know it was working. But basically, when it's uh, in operation, these get cut off, and there's a little hook at the back that hooks into the, the back of the pause terminal. So basically, uh, you have a, an insertion card. You make like you're, you're making a transaction. Yeah, we have. Uh, and you insert it into the pause terminal. And uh, it sits as a shim in between the actual terminal itself and the card. Now, we'll have a look at... Uh, yeah, we have the... Yep. So here we see it installed, and basically it sits there quite happily. Uh, the pause terminal manufacturer, uh, if you can see the kind of little divots in that, uh, that card acceptor, helpfully left me lots of space. For, it was just the right size for my microcontroller. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, in this version, we simply insert it, it hooks in, uh, and just lives in the pause terminal. And you know, once a week, once a month, someone rocks up with uh, a card like this, except we'll just put a sticky label on it to, to make it look like a card like this. Insert it in, and it will download all the data to this, uh, to this Jacob card, and, uh, and we can walk away with it. Now, we, we did this research back at the end of last year, and uh, subsequently we've discovered that, in fact, uh, these devices are out in the wild, and in fact have been found out in the wild uh, with a handy little uh, 2.4 gig radio chip, so you don't even have to show up with your car to download the data. And they also had a serial number printed on it, which I think is very scary. Right. Yeah. So, uh, just so that you can do the happy handing, which I know it's important. Oh, well, well, Let's I'm, brush that, up. I'm just going to quickly, uh, I'll quickly show you a couple of other quick bits. If this has wakey wakey, no, no hold on. One. It's uh, it okay. is one. Yeah. Here we go. So. We also developed uh, a device to, to do the Cambridge attack. This is called Spider. So here we have our stolen card that theoretically would not be uh, usable at all. And again, you just pop Spider on there and just put a sticker over the top. And Spider will, will implement the Cambridge attack. Yeah, you'll so, notice I covered up my card number while... Uh and also, we, we, we knocked up another little device uh, because some of these uh, chip and pin terminals aren't very compliant, so they have a nice decorative cover around the keypad. We have well, pictures for that. Yeah, well, we discovered yeah. we could pop it off, and this guy, when it's populated, is uh, about two millimeters thick, and it will sit there and skim the, uh, the key presses using IR brake beams. So, so to sum up, we think an EMV skimmer poses a serious threat due to the ease of installation and very difficult detection. Uh, there's simply too much data going on in the clear from the car to the terminal, which can be used on fraudulent usage on websites, 
Uh, if you brute force the CVV, you can still clone to max stripe, and we can always intercept the pin uh, that, can, uh, that then can be used uh, with a stolen car on an ATM to get cash, uh, despite the car configuration and type. Uh, and this, all of this uh, raises serious liability considerations when the pin is being used. Uh, we got a very nice vendor response. Uh, the, my favorite quote is MasterCard spokesman said in an interview that the EMV system is simply too complex for an easy fix. When you have a technology that is so complex that you cannot fix it when you have security vulnerabilities, you should trash it and do something better. However, in the Netherlands, uh, the hole has been fixed. They just shut down every point of sales for four hours, and they broke uh, compatibility with the standard uh, by disabling the possibility of doing plain text pin verification with domestic cars, because they knew that all domestic cars are DDA. Uh, they can still do uh, the plain text pin verification with the foreign cards. Um, the actual country code on the card is not signed, so we're not sure if this actually is an effective method or not. <laughs> Yeah. And we have to apologize to, to any, uh, any Dutch people here because we did take uh, effectively the pause network in Holland offline for two days while they patched their firmware. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so recommendation, they should do crypto from start to end with proper implementation. There's no other way around it. Uh, the, the, this is simply too complex. And it is a wrong concept to put your pin in a device which you cannot trust when it is the card itself that verifies the pin. Uh, the terminals cannot be trusted as we've seen. This is a terminal which is actually being tampered with and no, no tamper-proof sensors went off because they don't concern about uh, this kind of outer casing and about the actual card slot. So of course you can patch EMV by disabling as the Netherlands did plain text pin verification on every POS and ATM in the world. Uh, it, it can be done. Uh, some, some say, you know, it's too complex. I think it's feasible, but you know, this should probably spend some time to, to, to build a better protocol. Uh, so when you get EMV in the US, let's hope that this will be fixed. Uh, and we will be all be happy to help you in doing that. So uh, happy ending. Give these guys the happy ending. <laughs> uh, Okay, so um, I'll do this really quickly because we don't have a huge amount of time, but um, Zach and I were here on a business trip uh, back in February, and while we were here, there was a lot of buzz about this new um, system that was available. Um, basically, it's a credit card processing system um, which allows um, hookers and drugs, I mean small businesses, <laughs> to accept um, credit card payments, uh, and you get this little dongle and you stick it in your um, iPhone or your iPad, and you can then swipe um, cards. So we were looking at this thing, and we thought, oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. Um, how does it work? And a friend of ours gave us one um, to play with, and so we had a look at it. And we were sitting in the lounge on the way home. We had about a half hour layover in the lounge. And so we looked at this thing, and we decided, um, obviously, it was just using audio. Oh, lost the video. Video. You've lost your video. Maybe cable? Yep. There you go. Yeah, it's cable probably. Um, so, yeah, it's obviously just using audio. It's converting the mag stripe to audio, and then the audio is being processed by the application on the iPhone. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Heard this before? So, yeah, I gave a talk about five years ago called Mag Stripe Madness, which was all about dicking with, with um, credit cards using sound cards and so on. Um, do you want to stick me? On. Technical uh, problem. Two. Um, two. So we ran across the road, uh, across the road, across the hallway um, from the lounge, and we went into Brookstone and we bought one of these little uh, adapter cables um, to convert a, a standard PC into a Mac input. And I fired up my old software. And um, basically, what my software does is it'll take an arbitrary string and convert it to sound uh, in the same way that a, a card reader would. Wrote a little application called um, CNP, which is card not present. And if I play it, 
That's what it sounds like. So that's data being converted to what a mag stripe would sound like if you swipe. Okay. So the idea is we now feed this into um, the Square application. Now, we're not, we're not going to do this step because um, we did it at Black Hat. So we found this um, willing victim, actually, benefactor. Sunshine. Um, sunshine. So um, we're going to give her some money. And we did this demo at Black Hat. Strangely, when we tested it this morning, it doesn't work anymore. Her account, when you try and swipe a card, goes, oh, you're a new user. How would you like to set up a new account? And you go, OK, and set up the account. And then you swipe the card again and it says, oh, you're a new user. How would you like to set up an account? So um, the speaker goon that walked me around here, Agent X, has a badge on his, his jacket saying, fuck it, let's do it live. So fuck it. Uh, anyone got a Square account? Want some money? <laughs> Question was how much? OK, so the, the other half of the proposition is we've got these gift cards. We couldn't test this in the UK because you have to have a US bank account uh, and you have to have a US credit card. We had neither. We, we solved the, the second problem by just popping into a convenience store and buying a US gift card, which is a debit card, um, a.k.a. a credit card. Um, so I have 100 bucks on here. OK, you have a working Square account? Come on up. Perfect, Claire. Just see what happens here again. Volume. Got it properly. Epic fail. You have got the three poles for being there. Okay, so, so this is what happens when we um, do it onto the existing account that we tested at Black Hat. So there's two possible things. They've either flagged the card. Um, turn it the right way up. I'm not oh, sure can't. I can. Okay. You could, you could, Cameron, you can read sideways. You're at DEF CON. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing Apple technology. Hack your brain. Um, so yeah, we tested this at Black Hat. Square does geolocation. So we can assume they went, ah, who was at Black Hat at this time and did a $1 transaction? Um, OK, we'll block that account. So we're guessing that account's been blocked. Or they flagged the card. You'll notice I, ca I brought up gift card two on my screen. So we've got two of these babies. So if you flagged the card, tough, we got another one. Uh there, there was uh, another possibility, Can we do the which uh, they could have possibly twigged that the signature was slightly suspect. <laughs> you think so? Yeah, yeah that, that, that looks that. fine to me. Uh, of course, th this was this was done after they'd actually verified the transaction. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to flip back to camera now, if I can. So if this this gentleman here, I was hoping for an attractive young lady that I could offer money to in Vegas, uh, but uh, I guess he'll have to do. Right. So to make this a, a legal transaction, I really ought to buy something from you. Um, so uh, maybe some advice. Uh, bend over. There you go. Will you bend over for me? <laughs> Told you there was a happy ending. For a buck. Come on. For a dollar. Come on. We're running out of time. Present a fee. What do you mean, just stand a bit? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Woo! Okay, for that, I'm going to give you 10 bucks. Okay, so um, we're going to try, hopefully, get the screen to work. We'll put 10 bucks onto there. So, do you, wanna, do you need to come and operate your device? Okay. So, how, you want to set it to take a payment? If I just swipe a card, maybe? Uh, try swiping the card. No, you're on account settings, so hit back, I guess. Ah, ah you're not logged in. Oh, I need to log in. Okay, we might not want to watch this step. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
All these people are busy stealing my money. So that was a valid credit card I flashed up there. Uh, if you can get the 100 bucks out before he gets his, it's yours. Yeah. It's B4358808519090. Fail. Sign in failed. I don't know. Sign in failed. Yeah, they blocked DEF CON. I guess the vendors in there are pretty unhappy as well. I saw some of them using Square too. They just flagged the entire Rio as a. Yeah. 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 Take Square off for an hour. We'll be fine. One minute. Ooh. Two minutes. If I give him 20 bucks, do we get three minutes? It's going. It's going. It's logging in. Signing in. Okay, it does say signing in at the moment. Sign in, fail. Uh, Sorry. Never use a human for a demonstration. I know. Anyone else got Square Account? Real quick, that's working and live and up and ready. Get up right. here. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's okay. Thanks for trying. I'll buy a sprint for ten dollars. If he bends over, I'll give him twenty. You want to bend over? Yeah, go for it. Woo okay, so so do you swipe first or do I type the money first? Um, I should be able to just hit swipe and it should say I've seen a card. Is this an iDevice? No, it's an Android device. Okay. No, that's the fail. It doesn't have the... We're using the iPhone adapter. Okay. Lots of screen. No video. No video. Any no video. Else? Hang on, probably went to sleep. No. 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 So. There. There. Yay. Okay. Please retry. Swipe quickly. Have to play the volume. I just bloody turned it off. Knob. Slide to unlock. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> okay, so we've obviously got volume differences with Android. Are you happy with your Android um, speakers? Okay, I think we're going to have to call it epic fail, but you saw the, um, the screenshots from the demo that did actually work over at Black Hat. But uh, yeah, thanks. Anyway, that was a new twist on an old hack. Thank you. Thank you.